everybody, how you doing? Welcome to uh, the Wolf Standard Podcast. We're on video two, uh, but I have a, a kindred spirit with me in, 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 in office. Is that what we are? Kindred yeah, spirits. I think we are because we've, we've actually been talking for the last, I think, uh, two hours, two and a half hours yeah. <laughs> without right. recording anything. <laughs> uh, but I'm here with uh, Andy Tanner and we are going to be discussing as kind of a, a, a follow up um, to Greg Lukianoff's uh, podcast uh, a few weeks ago uh, called The Coddling of the American Mind. And the subtitle is How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Yeah. And what was interesting is you, you know, you had uh, posted something on social media yeah. and, you know, put kind of the, the, the idea out there is what, what is coddling, what isn't it? Uh, and then I happened to be interviewing the, 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 so the author. So it was sometimes, interesting. sometimes, you know, I'll get a book recommendation from Patrick because he's always reading fascinating stuff. This one we actually both were reading independently. Yeah. yeah. And uh, kindred kindred minds. Kindred minds. We'll see. We'll, we'll see <laughs> after the podcast. We'll find out, right? <laughs> uh, but thanks everyone for uh, for listening. So let's uh, let's kind of get into it. I mean, what? Yeah. So how did you hear about the book? I remember asking. Uh, that. You know, the Rich Dad Advisors. We do a book every six months, mm. and this one wasn't in it. But Robert had come across it and said, "Here's another one." So we didn't study it formally. So I picked it up. And, uh, you know, he has a lot of books. He, he re- he's an insatiable student. Yeah. He reads as much as anyone I know. So he's always got a book to recommend. And so I picked it up and uh, started with the audio book while I was on the treadmill. I know it doesn't look like it, but I do, uh, I do engage the good. treadmill from time to time. <laughs> uh, and it, I just found it fascinating because uh, on, on the roles we have in our life is, you know, entrepreneurs, investors, coaches, and parents. Mm-hmm. And the one that hit me probably the hardest was the parents. We'll probably talk about all of those. Yeah, but, yeah. but the idea, you know, when I thought about it, I, sometimes when you read stuff and you feel a good vibe on it, I always say, okay, am I feeling a good vibe because of confirmation bias? In other words, do I believe this stuff and this guy's singing my song? That's right. That's right. You tell him. That's right. <laughs> You know, am I reading it because it's articulating a belief I already have well, or do I really like this because because some books challenge what you believe. Those are the best ones. Mm -hmm. The ones that say, wow, I'm believing differently now than I did before. I think that's maybe true learning. So, and this one is probably the former because it resonated with a lot of what I believe politically already and, you know, the way I operate. Uh, and I defend it because sometimes I get accused of when I when I what I see is non coddling. Let's put it on a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you have coddling, yeah. which would cause brittle bones with no resistance. But the other end, you have abuse, which is breaking bones. So as a coach, you know, as a basketball coach, I have parents that see me on both of those spectrums. Mm-hmm. Some of them say I'm too soft. Some of them say I'm too hard. Some of them like Goldilocks think I'm just right. That's very few. All based on what you're actually doing at the time. So you have multiple perspectives analyzing how you're coaching, how you're leading. Some describe it as, you know, more toward coddling. Others describe it as abuse. Correct. Interesting. Okay. And and in the book is, is, is if you, you know, not to do a spoiler, but it speaks a lot to academia, a lot. Yeah. And the idea that in academia, we're really just dealing with words mm-hmm. uh, and ideas most of the time. We don't have a lot of practical, you know, outside of academia in the real world is where you get hit in the face. Yeah. Um, and so the idea is how weak are children? Uh, of course, you can't just lump them all together into one, no. but, but how do you do that? And as an investor... Um, you know, do you want to have, do you want to be strong? Are entrepreneurs, is it just easy for us? Yeah. You know, is the, is the world of competing and being an entrepreneur just a piece of cake where, you know, you don't need any resistance to prepare you? And that's where I think the, that's the very, that's the variable is the degree of like, what is resistance? Uh, what is the environment of learning, right? And that's where if you look at the, you know, it says good intentions, what's the intention? The intention Right is protection is protect is to protect. Yes. Okay. Is that a, is that a good thing? 
Okay, I think it is, but it's it's in certain contexts. There has to be a certain you know situation in which protection is good. Is, is protection good always? So that's yeah. where it comes down to. What is, where you know, is that line? Where is, is that it? line? Like, what, what is, is trauma? That, what is that environment where yeah. it is trauma, right? Or it's disruptive or against uh, you know against a specific belief, right? Right. And how do you how do you uh, govern that? Well. Let's talk about investing first. We know uh, that if you invest, uh, at least I don't know how it is in other things, but in the stock market and the options market, I don't know anyone that hasn't incurred losses. And I don't know anyone who hasn't uh, dealt with nervousness, fear, uncertainty, setback. Uh, you're dealing with emotions of fear and greed and you know, all those types of things. Again, seeking reward, wanting to avoid risk. So I will, I will tell you my opinion is in that arena, better have, better have a pretty strong spirit, yeah. better have some, some guts, better have some stick to itiveness. And if uh, you know, losing money hurts, now is that abusive? Losing money isn't physical. No one has ever died because of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And in, in this idea to protect the perfect little psyche, you know, wh what resistance is well, look at required? Look at sports too. Look at sports too. It's perfect right? analogy. So you look at sports. Resistance training. You look at, I mean, if you coddled an athlete, how long are they going to be an athlete? They're not going to be an athlete yeah. at all. And so that's the thing is, is, as far as growth is concerned, that's the, it's the, inter it's an interesting dynamic, right? Because, you know, we're trying to avoid pain, but yet pain is, is the way, you know, Ryan Holiday, ob obstacle is the way. Right, so when thing is is when there's resistance, it um, it's going to be pain. It could it could be painful, but also that's a catalyst to growth. So is that tr is that absolutely true? Yeah. So let's let's decide this. Let's talk about pain for a minute. Yeah. Is pain good or bad? That's the first thing. Pain good or bad? We tend to want to not have any of it. For sure. But yet we understand that it's no kinda, pain, no gain. Yeah. So how much pain is healthy? I, I think it has to do with damage, yeah. right? I think your analogy of an athlete is great, is if I resist, if I do the push-ups enough, I'm sore the next day. I do the DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. It's painful. It's well, it not, rips your muscles. But it lets, rip. rips it out, but that's how the growth comes, yeah. right? So through pain comes the gain. It's very true. You yeah. put astronauts into space, biggest problem is there's no resistance, yeah. and you can kill someone with no resistance. Yeah. It, it's this lethal as if you shot him with the gun. Yeah. So, so here you have the spectrum of abuse on one side, coddling on the other. One causes brittle bones, others will break, even the strongest ones. Yeah. That's, I guess, what we're here to figure out and talk about. Well, yeah. let's, let's talk about what the book, you know, what's the point of the book, right? So the book's called The Coddling of the American Mind. So it's not saying Good coddling is bad, like if you coddle your child, right? Or if you coddle a baby. It's saying the coddling of the American mind, mind. right? So what's, what, is he, what is he saying with that statement? Well, I think what happened, the book deals a lot with that. I can name it. They're saying, look, can an idea be harmful and damaging, right? Do we need to protect people from ideas? So, for example, uh, someone's on one side of an issue. Maybe, it's, um, maybe there's a rape victim yeah. who's going to speak. Mm -hmm. And this rape victim might say, I'm going to talk about being strong and saying, look, you need to move on with your life and you need to understand that that guy doesn't have the power to take away your worth, mm -hmm. take away your value. It was an episode. Uh, get the help that you need, but don't let, it, don't let that guy take control of your life. Yeah. Then there's a big group of people say, well, look, if you give that message, that's insensitive to the other rape victims. Very real, very real conversation yeah. to have. Yeah and say, hey, we're gonna boycott this speech because by being on campus, that validates the rapist yep. in some way. And so, you know, and there were some really ludicrous examples on one extreme that he gave, but the problem is it's a slippery slope into abuse, yeah. is you don't wanna tolerate abuse. So when you say the American mind, can words harm someone? You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but you know, names will never hurt me, is that yeah. what it is? Or yeah. words will never hurt me? Yep. So being called names, um, you know, be name calling or, or ideas that are posing to yours, uh, are they harmful? And his, his, obviously his premise is no, they're not. 
So that's where, all right, so let's go, let's go to the growth of the, um, you know, the American mind, whatever it's called, called in, the, in the title. Like what is, what's the growth he's re- re- referring to, right? So the American mind, it's, you know, it's growing. Like how does, it gr- how does it grow? Is it the same principle of resistance that applies to, you know, ath- ath- athletics, yeah, right? He, well, he seems to think so. You know, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Right, and if it if it doesn't give you resistance, you become weaker. So when you get into society to have to function in real life, I'll tell you, there's this thing called competition, and as entrepreneurs, we see this competition, and it it hits you. It is a yeah. fight. Yeah. And so if a person can't stay in the fight and fight for what they believe, you know, I'm just damaged. I'm just. Yeah. And the other thing is that sinister is. It can also be a ploy to kill the dialogue. Like if you embrace the idea that coddling is a good thing, that's a very good way to kill the dialogue of your opponent as a yeah, weapon. for sure. Say, well, let's not let them hear this because it's just too harmful. And now information has been controlled. Yeah. That's how cults happen, Yeah. right? Information control forms people's beliefs. Yeah. And if you control the information, and only people only get one set of information, yeah. and they're not allowed to address an opposing idea because it could kill them and damage them. When you look at information as something that's damaging, how do you ever find the truth if you don't have it? Well, that's where you know. So Greg is, you know, he's the the CEO of Fire, which is the foundation of uh, individual rights and yeah. education. Not not the party in the Bahamas Fire. Let's make no, that, <laughs> I let's never made that, that connection. Let's I should have clarified that with Greg. That. Greg. So you're not the guy that's behind uh, you're, this. You're not like, the, you're the not bohemian the paradise that uh, supposedly was going to... Emergency <laughs> tense. That's a whole other <laughs> podcast. Amazing, totally There's amazing. another two and a half hour that's conversation. Pretty funny, yeah. That's pretty funny. It's <laughs> right. obviously spelled F-Y. Yeah. I think R-E yeah. instead of... Uh, anyway, so Greg, you know, he... So the where, where he, you know, creates his uh, advocacy is, is through, you know, defending uh, free free speech, Right. So, you know, the free speech idea, which is, you know, essentially the, you know, the openness of being, people being able to share ideas and information, right? right. And so that's where it's like some information, some ideas, it, it could be harmful, okay? But at the same time, you know, what's the difference between being harmful and, and resistance or something in contrast to a person's beliefs? And it comes down to, all right, I mean, everyone's going to have a certain belief system of certain perspective, okay? And... Obviously, having an exchange uh, of ideas, right, is going to be able, you know, to, to essentially, uh, it could potentially ruin a person's beliefs, right? It could have them question certain things. It could have them, you know, maybe question the school in this in this sense, or the ideas that the trauma. school is sharing, right? It can create it can create trauma, but at the same time, it's like, how is the ex- the exchange or the protection of ideas being shared going to be traumatic? Because it's you could be you can. You can justify trauma on both sides. If you look at free speech and we isolate that idea of just words, it's easy to find the abuse and start there and work backwards. Yelling fire in a crowded theater when it's a hoax, obviously not not a good thing. If it's a credible threat on someone's life, a bomb threat, well, that's just my freedom of speech. Well, no, that's a credible threat. Yeah, Uh, That's harmful. So then you start to back that off and you say, well, can words cause pain? And, you know, I, I think that he talks about in the book a lot about what's the Latin for truth, for verity Veritas, or yeah. veritas. Yeah. That in the search for truth, though, ideas are going to have to be challenged. So now you move from yeah. threatening people or lying to the idea of honest dialogue that may be right or may be wrong, yep. but there has to be that fight. And yeah. in a fight, there's going to be stress there's gonna and he sees that as a healthy thing for sure and if if someone says well i'm uncomfortable talking about this this is causing me stress well is it stress or is it damage is it permanent you know and that's where he says we're our intentions are good don't make people uncomfortable um there's there's so many issues that are race issues religion issues more moral issues political yeah. all these issues that people are attached to and yet, if you if you isolate people in academia, and decide which ideas are healthy and unhealthy, uh, can it, sticks and stones break my yeah. bones? Ideas should not yeah. harm me. Well, an indivi- it's indiv- it's interesting to to look at. I mean, I, I interviewed Ed Griffin uh, as part of this season, and he's hmm. really big in, into 
you know, the idea and the protection of the, indi the individual and that the collective is, a, is an abstract, right? Yeah. That the collective doesn't think, right? The individual thinks, right? And so if you really look at, you know, the fostering of, of a mind of a young, a young person, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, obviously, you, we have our perspectives of the world, okay? And it's a certain way and we have certain strengths, we have certain abilities, we have certain tendencies, Okay, but our, our children, even though, you know, when they're young, we have a, a sense of stewardship over them, they're individuals, right? And they're going to have a different way of looking at a lot of different things, right? So oftentimes as parents, right, you want to protect them and you want to make sure that they don't get harmed. But at the same time, how are they going to discover their individual, you know, individual personality, their perspective, their characteristics, their strengths, their, you know, their talents? How are they going to discover that without uh, the environment in which they're challenged? You make a good point here is, you know, tribalism is primal it takes seconds to happen and and certainly from a sociological standpoint we live in tribes as human beings yeah. we have our political tribe we have our work tribe we have our religious tribe our social tribe yep. all these family yeah. tribe yep. and what happens is is tribes do have groupthink tribes do have this is our you know i mean Libertarians, Democrats, Republicans, they all have a statement they make, say this is what we believe. So anything that is opposed, any idea that opposes that is an attack on that group. And of course the idea is to protect people. So yeah. this idea of coddling is another weapon yeah. to say, not up for discussion. Can't discuss it because it might hurt our group or do, it, it really kills the fight. Yeah. And, and that's how, you know, cults are a scary thing because if you look at a Mooney's cult or, uh, you know, other cults, I better not name names or get in trouble because that's not a cult. But, but, you know, you look at maybe a, a Hubbard type of figure. Yeah. Every one of them tries to control information. And they say, look, this is the information that's good for you and this is the information that's harmful to you. And you can see there's a trap in that is that a person will never escape into, into what could be the truth. Maybe they have the truth, hopefully they do, but no one has all of it, yeah. at least we don't think so. Uh, if you forbid conversation or information, you've now created a mechanism that will trap people from truth. And, and I can't imagine that that's the way to protect truth. Uh -uh. Um, it, I think most of the times it's the way to uh, defend something that might not be or hide truth. We also have, you know, when it, when it comes to our, our evolution as, as people, as humanity, right, we're, we're always, we're, I think you're, you're either growing or you're dying. Like, you, you just don't sit stagnant in life. I think we're, we're compelled to move forward, right? I mean, I, it, I, I think that's, you know, probably no something that's hard, that's hard yeah. to argue. But then you, like, have to define, okay, what is, what is, gro what is growth? And I look at, you know, like as you said, I mean, it goes to, to Maslow, right? What is, what is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs show? It shows, you know, you first seek food, shelter, clothing, yep. then you seek, uh, seek safety. Yeah. And a safety is found in tribes, in groups. Yes, it is. Right? And that's where, you know, what is the next, what's the next? The high, that's the love. Highest, but the highest part is self, self actualization. It is. And that's where it's like, but still, you, you have, you can't achieve a self actualization unless you have your the group. You, you have a yeah, sense of safety. safety. Right, and then there's you know the ego, the the self-esteem side of side of things too. Uh, it's it's interesting because we're we're kind of you know we're compelled right to to seek safety. Yeah. But we're also compelled you know to love and also be empathetic, which is the you know self-actualization in a sense, right? So it's one of those like we're, we're, everybody's at different different stages, and that's why when you look at a a tribe, it's full of individuals at different stages. Sure. And in a sense, tribes both protect, but they can also inhibit. Right? And when you look at academia, you look at the purpose of school and education, okay, it's not to memorize you know, uh, multiplication tables. Right? What's, it what's it supposed to do? It's an environment right, in which your mind grows. It's challenged. You have new information. It grows even more. It's challenged even more. It grows even more. And that's the thing is I, I look at academia and these days it's just the subject matter. It's like you don't need half of it. Right, I think academia, for the most part, is teaching kids how to learn, but is it teaching them the right way to learn? Well, I can tell you not just knowledge, but like toughness. And so another great book is Jay Billis's Toughness. And he talks about what toughness is and the difference between a rock and a rubber tire. In academia, what, what's interesting is the kids, or young students, I should say, 
eventually they're going to have to go out into into the real world uh, eventually. Yeah. And if we coddle, <coughs> you know, can they survive the world? That's the big thing. Are they strong enough to deal with the realities of setback? Yeah. And one of the things in the book that's interesting is he talks about the 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 Generation Zs and and these guys that were brought up on their phones and social media, where the fear of being left out is traumatic, I the guess. fear of being different. The fear of not being liked on the Facebook page, the fear of seeing all your friends someplace where you didn't get there, and, and all this stuff causes all these anxieties yeah. that, that maybe you and I can't empathize with. Uh-huh. We, didn't, we didn't get it yeah. growing up. We got the we got the page. Yeah. The page. So so what's interesting is if we go back, to the beeper. You didn't have a beeper. I didn't have. I, I actually a, didn't have. I one. couldn't My afford one. one. My friends had one. The doctors one. had them. You know. <laughs> but got a page. <laughs> I got to got to head out. I got a got an aneurysm. I got to go fix. <laughs> <laughs> got a veil. <laughs> but okay, doctor, it's the life you're in. Go back to to pre Columbus. You know, Native Americans. I mean, what was adversity for those kids? You know, starving, uh, not being able to get the buffalo, yeah. you know, getting beat up by the surviving, other tribe. Surviving I mean, the winter, yeah. Their idea of, of uh, stress and difficulty was probably much more physical yeah. than social emotional. We have almost no physical, I mean, you're going to have the bullies and stuff, but I'll tell you, by and large, it's more emotional toughness and emotional battles that these guys have to fight. Yeah. And I don't think it's shutting off the social media. I think it's learning to to deal, to face it, not hide. Yeah. Um, facing up, manning up, yeah. womaning up, adulting up, whatever you yeah. want to call it, and not hiding from, from these little things that get magnified. And he talks a lot about that in the book too, is that by creating the safe place, suggests that it's a horrible outside like, yeah. like there was a story maybe you can remind me of if someone in went in to get some counseling and they said now this is gonna happen this guy whoa, whoa, whoa yeah. look I just want to talk to someone yeah. uh, it's not like oh no you're gonna have this this is gonna harm you this is you're gonna have to work through this, this is gonna get worse you got PTSD this is no I just want to talk to someone I just feel like talking and I think I'll be okay no 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 you're not okay you've been harmed you've been crazy right where does that come but where does it come from? Does it come from, is the intention so that they're safe and that they're protected and that I, they, they're, I, they're protected from harm? I mean, what's the... What's what, what, where I might disagree with what he said is he says good intentions and bad ideas. I'm not so sure they're always good intentions mm-hmm. because if you have an ideology you're against and you can create and paint it as toxic, that gets it out. You don't have yeah. to. You don't have to address it. You don't have to debate it. You don't have to prove it wrong. You say, "Look, it's harmful. It's out." So you can eliminate something from the public debate and the public dialogue by just labeling it as toxic, and now people will be trapped in the ideology that that, that the person prefers. So he says, "Good intentions and bad ideas." Is that always good intentions? Are we yeah. always calling good intentions, yeah. or is this a way to keep things out of a? Of a public dialogue by labeling it toxic yeah right that's a good I'm like all sorts of stuff is going through my head right now so all right let's instead of going off on on tangents so in the end I mean what is the what what do you what do we learn what do we learn from it like what are what are some of the things you take away and say okay you know what what is the right thing what is not the right thing where do we where where do we draw the line because it's a very I would say you know gray area and it's very situational but well, where do you... Well, I'll tell you this. I don't know. I mean, I don't have the answers to that or I'd write another book. But, <laughs> but I will tell you this. I think the part of the value of reading a book like that is the mindfulness of it. Is when we're in a situation, like let's say I'm coaching basketball. Yeah. Is I can say, okay, on this side's calling and this side's, side's abuse. Yeah. I might not have the answer, but if I think about it, I'll probably get closer to it than if I don't. And at that least I can at least I can consider it, right? Are we coddling or are we being abusive? Yeah. And if we just if we don't even ask the question, we just go with abuse. This is abusive. It's out every time. Yeah. Or this is calling. It's out every time. At least the idea of having that spectrum to consider probably make you better father, maybe make you better coach. Yeah. Not a perfect one, yeah. but it probably do a better job. And as an investor and entrepreneur, same thing. Um, you know, call. Ca- Definitely don't want to, I don't want to be guilty of either one. That's what I put on my Facebook page. I don't want to be an abuser, but I don't want to be a coddler. Yeah. 
Uh, it is situ it is situational, and you know, is it is it uh, is it possible to to know exactly what to do in every single situation? Probably probably not, and that's why I would say you know, dictating policy around how you deal with resistance is very very it's con it's concerning, right? Yeah. Because you're allowing one person or a gr you know group of people that have interests that have bias, right, to dictate take away your power, talk, take away your power, take away from your you know, ability to know how to act for yourself in that specific situation. We're probably biased in that you and I both feel the power of an individual is very, very strong. Yeah. When I'm on my podcast addressing difficult issues and I, you know, most as an educator, my solutions are to the individual. Yeah. Often on my podcast, I have people who want a systemic solution. So they go to Congress and they try to lobby for this law and that law. I go the opposite way. I said, look, there's nothing you can do about what Congress says. But you as an individual, you can make decisions to better your life and improve yourself. Yep. And, and so there's always going to be that. Um, you know, it, it's going to be an interesting experiment. I have a little basketball team that I coach. And, you know, I'll, I'll share the story. Half the people are going to think it's awesome. Half the people are going to think I'm an abuser. <laughs> but we were playing below our potential in a game. And we were... Uh, we were down by like four. We should have been beating this team by 40, right? I mean, it's just, we weren't playing our best. So I called a timeout and I lined the kids up and I said, this is a one minute timeout. We're gonna run a sprint during the timeout and we're gonna get tired one way or the other. We're gonna get tired playing hard or tired sprinting. And so they ran the sprint. And as soon as they went back, they got back out to play. I called my second timeout and I had to do it twice. And the other team, Cell phones are coming. I know this is going to be on YouTube. You know, this crazy coach doing this. And what was interesting <laughs> is after the second time out, you know, that's a lot of running for two minutes to yeah. run sprints yeah. for two minutes. And I didn't care about the game. I thought we're going to lose this game because now I'm going to send them out tired. But you want to take advantage of the environment to but, teach a lesson. Right? But what I did is I looked him in the eye and I said, you know, I can write effort and tired down on a clipboard. And I could put it on a chalkboard. I could try to explain what it feels like to be tired. But I got to tell you what. How many of you look me in the eye and know what it means to give your all now and what it feels like to go to that place? Now you know what tired really feels like. And you weren't tired before when I called the timeout. You had energy left to burn. Now you've burned it. Now you know what it feels like. That's what it should have felt like when I called it. <laughs> and it was interesting because I had uh, parents, mostly from the other team, but I had parents that were just booing me and, you know, this and that. And after I had two or three quietly come up and said, boy, if you're ever looking for a player... I sure. love my son. I was, to the they thought it was great. And actually, one of those parents, I'm now coaching his kid. Wow. So what's going to be the test is this. 30 years from now, are they going to say, my life is a mess because I had this abusive coach and you embarrassed me in front of me, blah, blah. Or are they going to say, I learned the best lesson when I was 13 years old. Hmm. You know, running for two minutes is not physically harmful. People do it all the time. You get tired. You recover. No, one's, no one had a heart attack. No one was had a broken knee, but was that emotionally bolstering to that group or is that emotionally deteriorating to that group? But I think Time also, will tell, I don't know. And it's true, but I, I think also you have the relevance of the person that's actually controlling the environment at that time, right? And making those decisions and influencing yeah. those decisions, right? Where, and this again comes down, maybe it's intention, maybe it's leadership ability, right? But you could easily have seen a person who could have been, you know, a jackass, right? And have the kids sprint and yell at, and yell at them. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the example I always think of is, uh, I think it was like, is it Platoon or some war movie where Nick Nolte, right, was just this like jackass leader that nobody wanted yeah. to follow, right? But then you also had, you know, true leadership there uh, as yeah. well. Why do people, you know, follow certain people and not others? And it's interesting, I'm not sure if it's like, it's, it's kind of like a feeling in a, in a sense, right? Where the, the kids and knowing you, you know, the kids felt like, like you knew what was in their best interest and you knew that, or they knew. Maybe that, not, who knows? Maybe not, yeah. but I would say, yeah. you know, My opinion it was, yeah. or then, I wouldn't have done it. But. And that's where, you know, I, I look at, it's very, it is very situational. And at the same time, I look at, you know, we're gonna make mistakes, Right, and there's no you know, the perfection is, is an idea, is an idea. Like you're not nothing's hit perfect, it. right? Yeah, so you're not what's, hit it. what's the perfect way in order for, to deal with the situation? And I think the perfect way is to set, it, is to accept imperfect, but allow people right to actually figure it out, right? And yeah. that's where I look at you know free speech zones. 
Maybe somebody comes on campus and gives wrong information, right? But can't the, how do they learn to evaluate wrong information? And that's my point. Is like you have to have the experience where there is yeah. resistance and the ability for something false and something true to arise and for individuals to have that experience. And if you rob that experience, I, I do, I believe that that does, uh, it is that coddling, it does weaken, weaken an individual because when they go to deal with, because they're going to face resistance at some degree and, in the future and, the other thing, and how are they going to deal with that? And the other thing it does is it eliminates gray yeah. because by saying it, it, it teaches people to have a worldview of harmful and safe harmful and safe and we can categorize this oh that's not safe it's out oh that is safe it's in and it eliminates gray and the ability to have a gray area uh, to say not everything is like is dichotomous is that the word yeah, i'm looking yeah, for opposite i'm using words on a podcast that i don't understand yeah, but it seemed to fit that was a very but yeah that's awesome. as far as it goes okay <laughs> i'm good with the four letter words but i don't want to harm anybody you know i don't want to harm anyone yeah. But yeah, you don't want to have people seeing things in terms of he's right, he's wrong, or even he's good, he's bad, harmful, or safe. Yep. And by even suggesting, you know, I mean, here's what's interesting. He talks about a safe room. And he ta this blew my mind. He talked about announcing to students that, hey, I might do something that could trigger you. If you don't want to be around for it, go to the safe room and hold this teddy bear. I mean, literally, no, a teddy bear is in the room. I know. And by, by framing that to a young mind, by saying what, it, what could happen is dangerous enough to require a bomb shelter, right? A bomb shelter where we shelter you from these, I mean, you're, you're now putting people in like it's a nuclear freaking warhead. Yeah. And by sending that message, are we teaching people that words, that, that sticks and stones are not only the things that break home bones, you know, words can devastate your soul, your yep. spirit. Mm -hmm. And I just think, uh, gosh darn it, you know, let's not, let's not ever have information uh, controlled to where people, it just doesn't seem intelligent to say, here's information, don't read it. Because if that's a policy, you, you're not going to get to that veracity, that truth. Nope. And I think it's, it's not a, a, an absolute finish line, right? I think things are always being discovered, progress is always being being made, and what is true today may not be true tomorrow. And your debate skills go out the window because there won't be one. And you won't be able to kind of rationalize How do you articulate? what's right yeah. and what's right. And that's the thing is, we have a, so we have a saying that we use all the time, right? Because I've had experience in business and when you, where you had two conflicting ideas, and there was so much resistance there, and people were just, they, they didn't want to be wrong and just kept resisting and kept resisting. like. And that's, I don't, you know, those people are gone. I don't hire, I, I look for that now, right? Where individuals, I want them to pursue what's right, right? But not be adamant about what their opinion uh, is being right and not being willing to, or be, and being willing to, you know, be, be wrong, right? Or slightly wrong. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's like, if you look at dialogue, if you look at progress, you know, I think as an individual, um, we're limited, very limited. Like I think having conversations, um, especially group conversations where you have very, you know, when you have similar values and similar outcomes, multiple minds in there is a, just a profound dynamic. However, right, if you essentially, you know, prevent people from being harmed, you're never going to have that conversation to begin with, and the ideas don't it will not come to fruition. So you know, we've talked about it in the position of kind of being the leader of your own investments, of your own company, of your own sports team, or your own family uh, as parents. You know, I also thought a lot about this book in terms of whether I'm seeking out safety too often and whether I coddle myself by self-imposing restrictions on what I read or what I'm willing to listen to. Yeah. Um, it's been, it's, I think it's, I think no one gets out of cognitive dissonance. I just, it's just the way we're built. And it's I increasing mean, too. Yeah, it's just the way we yeah. are built. Yeah. And the challenge, and so flipping that in my mind is the challenge is, you know, how, how open am I to have my beliefs changed and not be coddled? And how might I be challenged? And there's a couple of fun websites out there. One of them uh, that I thought was, was fascinating is you, they'll take these really severe issues like gun control or abortion or 
stuff. And people will go there and say, please try to change my mind. I mean, I genuinely want to see if I can find the empathy for the other side to change my mind. It takes a lot of courage to do that. For sure. Because we become so entrenched. The news cycle is interesting because Walter Cronkite used to summarize everything that was important about 25 minutes and a couple commercials. Now it seems to me, I, I don't see the difference between Fox and MSNBC. I don't see a difference because I feel like both of them are just telling their crowd what, what they feel is right. Just, it's a it's validation. It's the narrative. Yeah, it's just a validation of their own narrative night after night. And it really separates people in good and bad. The tribalism that you mentioned with this idea that it's usually one tribe and another tribe that are trying to limit this information and yeah. coddle their own group. Yep. What's interesting about that is these two, these two groups, they're going to fight, they're going to fight, they're going to fight, they're going to fight. And they're never going to have the chance to get out of that, that, that rut because they're never going to, they've lost the talent and ability to consider something else. And what happens in tribalism is as soon as you put a label on a group, all of their individual merits are erased. Yep. For example, if you, if you don't like President Obama, you say, well, he's a Democrat. Okay, well, what type of father is he? He must be a bad one. Uh, what type of husband is he? Well, he must be a bad, you know, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe, the, maybe he had some interns in there with him. I don't know, you know, who knows what type of cigars he smokes. I think he quit smoking when he was in there. But what happens is, is when we get those divisions, we tend to erase all of the other merits yeah. that, that, that the individuals in that group might find. And as I look at my, my friends who are Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, um, I, have all, I have friends in all three groups that if I was in trouble, you know, my, my car broke down in the middle of the, the, uh, the freeway at three in the morning, I feel I'd call them and every single one of those guys would respond in the most uh, benevolent manner, willing to help, even though they're, they're in those different groups. So another part of this coddling of ideas is they're bad people, they're dangerous. You, you erase any merits they might have outside of that solitary issue. Yep. All of a sudden, the dean is unfit for office. All of a sudden, the, 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 the dean of this college should resign yep. because this issue. And it just erases any merits that a person... And that's what Greg and his company, you know, def defend, or Greg and his organization defend, the, one of the authors of this, of this book. And, and that's, the, that's, the biggest, that's the biggest thing right now because if, if kids, you know, going into college, like think about the environment that they're in, right? They, they grew up in a household where there was ideas that were... You know, they, they had high influence by, based on, on parents, right? Mm -hmm. Community, the city they grew up in, the, the state that they grew up in. So they have a certain perspective of, you know, of the world. Then they go into, you know, this environment in which it's different because you have kids that are all, all different. And in that mm -hmm. environment, right, it's, a, it's grounds to make, a, you know, a lot, of, a lot of change because your mind is pliable, um, you're highly influenced because it's new. But if you're given just one narrative, right, yeah. you're given one label, right, then now you go into the real world, it's going to be, it's going to be such a, a shock and, a, and it's, it's going to be a, a, a beyond whatever a crutch is, right? It's, it's one of those things where it's, you know, it's destroying individuals, you know, ability to, you know, think, think for themselves or thinking in groups. The, the evolution of the technology is interesting, though, because... We live in an information age where ideas are just thrown at mm -hmm. you all the time. Yep. So it makes sense that people that are in, feel that that's a war, because there is an information war, controlling eyeballs and controlling ideas now, that they would want to fight by saying, this is, a, this is an incoming missile. We can't have these missiles uh, pointed at us. Yep. It's such an interesting time to it be is. alive. It is. And it's... And it's it's fun at the same time, like, yeah, it's just, it's so much. I mean, it's information overload. So what we experience on a daily basis, you know, relative to, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Yeah. It's just, un, it's, un, it's unbelievable. And it continues to change. And I would say, you know, again, going back to some of the main points, it's like, you know, all, all human beings are flawed. All groups have flaws. But they all have strengths. And, you know, really the environment in which people, where, where discussion can take place, right, where exchange can take place, that's how we that's how we grow, and that sounds you know, 
utopia-ish, but at the same time, it's one of those one of those things where you know the freer a person is, the the more growth that exists. So if I f- want to run away from coddling, the further away I run from coddling, the closer I get to abuse. And if I want to run away from abuse, the further away I get from abuse, I'm in the coddling. Yeah. So the invitation for me in reading this book was to begin to see both of those extremes yeah. and try to come back to a larger awareness in each individual person, situation, situation. and role that I play to, to try to find a healthy place in the middle where there's enough resistance to grow the yep. bones but not enough resistance to break them. Yep. Cause I think cod- Dude, this is such a great a great point because I think the coddling is what shows a nurturing, you know, a sense of nurturing, and it, you know, there's like a feeling. It's every of bit intention. is dangerous. Yeah, but at the same time, if you have that intention and idea, but yet you allow for resistance, right? I'm talking more like a parent right now. Yeah. But if you allow for that resistance and difficulty because you understand how growth occurs, I think that's kind of like right right there in the middle. It, it's it's a tough thing. I for think sure, yeah. this. You know, we, we should usually start out talking about investing. We always come back to our kids. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's a big challenge in this environment. Oh, it know? totally is. And, and yet the competitiveness of it, I, I see parents that schedule out every bit of their kid's day, yeah. you know, no fortnight allowed, no play, because th- you've got to get the piano done, you got to get this done, you got to be the four-hour student, because yeah. you got to be prepared to get in this college. And, and they overtrain in order to try to make them strong enough to compete, you know, and they're scared their kids will fail. And then the other end of the spectrum is, is these people that just coddle it. I, I've seen it in sports where parents are so afraid to have their kids lose a game. Yeah. It's insane to me, lose a game. And, uh, you know, they'll get in, the, there's sandbagging that goes on where, you know, teams with huge talent will go and play in leagues with almost no talent so they can get their trophy. <clears throat> and it's just incredible to me. Well, look, and I, I'm not sure if you want to talk about this, but I'm going to break it up anyway. <laughs> but you, you know, we were talking, we were talking uh, previously about about your your boys, yeah. and you talked about your experience uh, with uh, playing basketball. I mean, you played at the U, uh, University of Utah. I sat on the bench at the U. I don't know how much we played. We played a little. But bit. You're on the team. Yeah, right? we played but a little. You, bit. But you didn't play high school, and the I reason didn't. why is because. You know, you were you said you were cut every single year, and you were cut. You know, it was interesting how they did the cuts, big cuts, then kind of a last smaller cut. cut, and then the one last person cut. Yeah, and you went through that four four times, three four times. I, yeah, I went. I I got cut seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, and once in college yep. before I made it. So, so that was obviously some was. pretty extreme. I mean, that could have been. Oh, it still hurts. It's it's dis- it's described. It could be described today as traumatic, right? Yeah. So, but at the same time. What did that create inside of, of you? Right? How did that start that, that, to form who right. you are and what you've pushed for? And That's an interesting, I, I think I'm not the only person that might have tried out for play and didn't get the lead. Yeah. And, and I think as investors, learning to understand that failure isn't fatal and failure is not the end of everything. Yeah, yeah. Did it hurt? Absolutely. Did it affect my self-esteem? Absolutely. Yeah. But at the same time, those were gifts in a way. Yeah. <clears throat> because you learn that hey, you don't you don't win every race and everything isn't roses all the time. And there's a he talks about in this book that there's a resilience that is inside of of people, uh, evolutionary I guess or God given one or the other, mm. to where there is a resilience built in where people can deal with the cancer diagnosis yeah, and figure it out. Deal figure it out. Deal, I mean, because there's you don't get. Think about this, you can control whether someone comes on a campus to speech, but you don't control when you hear the news that you got cancer or when you're being sued by a competitor and it's unfair. Mm -hmm. And if you can't handle a simple idea being brought on the campus, what's going to happen when you're in a lawsuit or when you get cancer or when your child gets cancer? I mean, how, when you're, that's, (laughs) you can't coddle your kid against you know, cystic fibrosis, Mm-mm. right? You know, you can't coddle them. There's certain things in life can't be coddled. So what makes us think that an idea can hurt these kids when there's so many more things, there's so much more emotionally severe. It will happen. Infertility, it will happen. loss of a child, uh, lawsuits, loss failures in business. Failures in relationships. You know, so you think, you know, these coddlers, you know, how devastating was it to try out every single year and get cut? Well, it was devastating, 
but not something I couldn't rebuild on top of the rubble. Um, well, what about a failure in a, in a business? What about a failure in investment? Mm -hmm. And then you get into bigger stuff. What about health failures? What, what happens when you lose a child? So there is definitely a resilience that can be strengthened or weakened yep. inside of us. And again, it's just finding that point where you bend but not break, where pain is a good thing, not a harmful thing. Too much lifting can be degenerative and cause your bones Absolutely. to hurt. Absolutely. But not enough can be degenerative yep. and cause your bones so to hurt. Where do you find it? I don't know, <laughs> but it's food for thought. For every investor and parent, where are you? Do you want to be coddled? None of us want to be, I think. I don't know. I think we all, I think this probably resonates with most people that, that listen beyond one episode of this podcast. For those who listen the first time, sorry, you know, but whatever. It, <laughs> no. it's, one of those, it, it's one of those things where you know, these principles apply to so many different aspects of, of life. Yeah. We obviously talked about you know, kids, we talked about sports, uh, bi business, uh, po politics. I mean, it applies. It applies to everything. And well, that's resilience. And th this is a worthy. Play. We should never apologize for this podcast because resi resistance is going to happen in business, and resilience is a prerequisite. I mean, yeah. uh, the strong survive in a world that competes, and we just you can't eliminate the competition because it's just the way life goes. So let's end, let's end with this because our season, the, these, the four, first four months of the year, we're talking about capitalism. Yeah. So the reason why I wanted to get this on is because, you know, obviously there, it's a different, you know, it's a different situation, but I think it's very, a very similar principle, right? Because the notion of capitalism, right, is one of those things where you, you, have, co you have commerce, you have the exchange of ideas and capital, and you're going to have success and you're going to have failure, mm -hmm. right? But free market capitalism doesn't really exist, right? Because you have, you know, uh, political influences. Uh, you have monetary yeah. policy influences. Yeah, you have regs. You know, and that's and that's the thing is, you know, r really, if you look at where we're at as a state of uh, the the economy, right? We've had artificial coddling, right, of certain institutions. That's a great way to say it. Yeah, artificial coddling of you know institutions of certain businesses, right? Of money, of money, currency, in, money in general, right? Yeah. Uh, of in, of of where people put money to invest and hope for some sort of you know future, right? So people have been coddled when it comes to, to commerce, uh, due to the coddling of the actual institutions that are serving them. Mm -hmm. And so I look at you know just how applicable these I ideas are uh, in that instance. And, and this comes down to maybe where we end, which is if you continue to coddle, you know, you have very weak bones. And so when resistance happens, you have breakage. What's interesting is there's both ends of the spectrum in capitalism. There's abuse because if a per, you know, he who has the gold makes the rules. Yes, and you have tyranny. It, it, there's a great way to think about it is is when you think about capitalism, if you want to take the other side of the argument, talk about the evils of it, yeah. if we dare do that, um, what's Superman's greatest superpower? He's got x-ray vision, he's strong. What's his greatest superpower? He can detect if the person's telling the truth? I'll tell you what I think it is. I think it's his heart. Because if you yeah, change, be because people. if you change Superman's heart, he becomes the world's greatest villain instead of the world's greatest superhero. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so if you if you have capitalism, and you have evil, people begin to grow. You have greed. You have those things. You yeah. have you have no benevolence. Exploitation. Oh my gosh! Yeah. You know it can't. So there is, there there is a range of, but yet if you coddle. <laughs> well, it's just as bad. It's just, yeah, it's the same thing. It's just as bad. So it's those a, two yeah, extremes. That's why it's like I think it's a, it's they're, they're very similar, if if not identical pr principles. It allow ca the thing that's beautiful about capitalism is allows for tremendous potential uh, for someone to be the greatest they could be. And then you look at a Warren Buffett and a Bill Gates. You know, look at the amount of money. You know, half their wealth are given away, uh, minimum. Half. They both made that pact. The no, Bill I think, Gates. I think it's like ninety nine percent. Well, isn't they it? have that club they started, where a billionaire can join and say, "We're going to give half our money away minimum." Oh, that's the club. Yeah, they yeah. will give far more than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Far, far more than that. And certainly, guys like Steve Jobs. When I look at what my kids learned in that iPad, they've get contributed in their products as well. So, so that I think there is ambivalence. But on the other side, you know, the Bernie Madoffs of the world. Yeah. Uh, 
they deserve to be prisoned as, you know, they've broken the rules. For sure. And that's where you, I mean, you have rules yeah. to protect people's rights. And that's where you look at the environment, though, and you're not going to ever have perfection. You're always going to have somebody. You're always going to have a birdie made off. Lie, you're always going to have Here's Steve what's Jobs. tough. Here's what's tough. If, if you, here's, here's probably a truth that we fight against. Um, and it depends on what your definition of, because it's just an idea that's man-made, but the idea of fairness. Yeah. Okay. So if you go into the Serengeti and you watch any other species, do they have fairness, <laughs> right? Do the champion, chimpanzees have fairness? Well, the one mother who got their daughter eaten by the lion when they weren't looking, well, that's not fair, right? Well, it's fair game. You're, the death of your chimp is fair game out there. We're not willing to accept that as human beings because we're smarter, you know, blah, we're not animals, yeah. but yet we are animals. It is an interesting idea that the pursuit of fairness is uh, is a great pursuit, but defining what it is and it's tough. I don't think you can. We all feel we all every human being wants to be treated fairly, you know. But perhaps it comes the, down to the same. It's situ it's situational. Yeah. So do you teach your child life is fair and you should expect it? Because even though we all want it and even though we want to pursue it, it's so difficult because life isn't fair in how we're born. Some people are born with higher IQs, some with low IQs. Some of us have to work harder for what we get than, than the smart kid, right? Uh, other people are limited physically. You know, the, the way you're born genetically, the genetic lottery isn't equal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unless you want to get into eugenics someday, uh, which we probably don't want to do, mm -hmm. how do you make it all fair just by the nature of birth? And so, you know, you're going to have it abuse and coddling and unfairness in between. Well, it's tough. It is, and that's where it's... Good you know, thing we have you to, to put you know, on this podcast and well, solve all these... Good thing we have you to, to you know, <laughs> incite the discussion. Now I look at, you know, you have the environment and it's, you know, human humanity has, you know, um, amazing things about it. It also has a lot of, you know, frailties and, and weaknesses. And that's where it's like the, you know, I would say the envi the most fair environment, right, is where... You know, I would say uh, people's rights are, are protected, yeah. right? But people are able to, to, to act and learn and grow. And, you know, and again, it's really hard to define because there's lots of different circumstances yeah. and situations. Equal but in the opportunity end, is very, very important to yep. fairness. And yet we have an inequality in the ability to capitalize. In, you know, I you totally can throw agree. out an equal opportunity, but individuals might not be able to equally capitalize exactly. on it because of what they're starting with. And so how do you subsidize... And that's that, where, whew. I don't know if we're that's ready where to we tackle that one that's where, we, that's where we start to coddle maybe, I don't know. But I would I say, know. you know, the things that you can do though is, you know, essentially have certain environments in which, you know, ideas can be expressed. I think that was the point of the, yeah. the, the book, right? That the ideas biggest thing is and you can't suppress ideas in the name of protection. Exactly. And that's where, you know, I think people, you know, really start to, to understand themselves and understand you know, growth and what their strengths are and abilities are, that it, ha it has to go through kind of like a, a refining process. It, it, it's a great question and, and invitation for discussion is what is harmful and what is the power of resilience? Um, are we not resilient enough to withstand an idea and a speaker on campus that disagrees with us? Yep. Are we not strong enough and resilient that that is abusive and yep. breaks our bones? And I think he just says, hey, let's put the pause button on here and understand that we might be taking this too far. And in his opinion, obviously we have. Yep. And I think for that reason, it's a very healthy discussion because I didn't realize how pervasive it, it was. I didn't either. I, I, no, I mean, the citing after the things he was citing and the sheer volume of cases and, and people just losing been, their jobs I know. Over, the, over two words in an email that oh, just yeah. got blown up. Being kicked out of school. And the fear of your colleagues and being tenured. And I mean, it's just, it was incredible. It's ridiculous. I had no idea what was going on in academia. Uh, I didn't realize there were safe rooms and trigger words and that, that my son in his school might be saying, now, this might cause you mental harm. If you want to go to the safe room, go ahead. That, that's unsettling, that level of coddling. Probably read what I like. I probably liked it because I agreed with it. Yeah. I confess. And there was, yeah, you look at, I mean, I have disagreement with academia in, in, in general in a lot of different sure. you know, aspects of it. But yeah, but I look at, you know, this is the next generation of, of those who are going to, 
you know, be in, be in the world, be producing things, be, uh, you know, solving employees, problems. Starting, starting businesses, solving problems. Yeah. And it's one of those things where, you know, in order to solve a problem, you have yeah. to be able to, to face some adversity, right? And on any issue, if the environment in which they're transitioning from, you know, home life where there was, you know, I think the highest protected, you know, kids of, of in generations, right? To, you know, really the environment, which is the inter, you know, it's the in between, right? Before they get into the real world. And if that is where, how the programming has taken place, it's like, they're not gonna be fit for most businesses, right? They're not gonna be fits for most, for most jobs because if they cling to this notion of tribalism, right? And it's like, yeah. here's, this is the, the idea and everybody has to believe a certain way and they're afraid of being wrong and they're afraid of getting hurt, yeah. that trauma. It's like, that, that's not a good, it's, it's not, not a person that solves problems. That's not, uh, that's not certainly not resilient. No, it's not. So. Yeah. Okay. Awesome discussion. Yeah, Thanks for having me. Four, it's always good four to have hour, Three and a half hour discussion. Uh, only two, only learned, an hour of it was, was recorded. I've learned, I've learned to plan for it when we get together. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> it's because right. we don't get together often enough. I know, no kidding. Too we much to, to catch up on. P.F. Chang's. Thanks right, much. Everyone. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks for watching or listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Awesome.